Hello everybody, this is a Fentricity webinar called Blockchain for Dummies like myself. We're going to talk about what the blockchain is, we're going to talk about our underlying approach, technology, components, um, cryptocurrencies and much more. So the agenda for the next few minutes, we'll try to stay within about 20 minutes time frame, are the following quick introduction, we're going to have a chat about what the blockchain is, the building blocks, the use cases, cryptocurrencies, main companies behind the technologies, disruptive ideas, and what the future looks like. Uh, we'll then at the end be able to take a few questions and we encourage you to do so. In terms of quick introduction, we are Fintricity. We have been around since 2001, which is now 15 years and we consult on agile digital transformation. So we're trying to take real use cases and analyze what the business value and what the impact is of these use cases to help companies become more digital. We consult on anything cognitive, we consult on disruptive technologies such as blockchain, the Internet of Things or many others and we also support with the change. My name is Florian Krüger, I'm partner in Fentricity and I am a technical disruptor by nature, even so really I'm a business person and um, my in-depth knowledge of technologies is limited to where I need it to be. So let me talk about what the blockchain is not. There are many misconceptions what the blockchain is and what it isn't. I'll tell you as a first point what it's not. And it's not Bitcoin. Bitcoin is something entirely different and we're going to talk at the end about what Bitcoin is. It's not regulated. There is no blockchain authority. Nobody oversees a blockchain management. There are government initiatives, there are various um, undertakings, but there's no regulation. It also isn't very easy to understand. Blockchain is a very often abused term. Semantics are convoluted and it's really, really difficult to wrap your head around it. So I'll try to use as much Lee Weekend language as I can and try to explain it to you as I would explain it to uh, somebody next near to me, dear to me, uh, who's not necessarily from within our space. Um, what it also isn't, and that's quite disturbing to us because I just mentioned that we are trying to be use case driven. Now blockchain is per se not business case driven or use case driven. Blockchain is just an application, it's just a database really. So let's talk about what it is on that note on the database. That's really what it is. It is a database. Moreover, it is a component of things. It is a database that consists of a chain. It consists of a specific way on how to store information that is on the chain, namely through a distributed ledger. Not a single ledger, not a single you know, thing that holds all the information centrally, but actually a thing that holds the information in many places. I'm going to talk about that in a second a bit more. It is resilient and secure because it uses keys. It is immutable, you can't change it. And it uses special nodes such as miners who are basically contributors that hold the ledger. And then there's this whole thing around design and development tools. So what does the blockchain actually use in terms of tools to not just be a database, but actually to be an application? So let's start with the chain. What is the chain? And I try to explain it to you in a very, very simple example that it is a little bit like a shashlik skewer or a kebab where you take piece after piece after piece after piece and put it on one skewer right next to one another. So the whole skewer gives you a picture. The whole skewer is time stamped. The whole skewer has an origin. You can see where the stuff is coming from. So this whole blockchain, this whole chain is like a skewer. You can't change it, you can't rip out 
a piece of meat and put it elsewhere because once it's ripped it's ripped so you can't really change it that easily which has to do with some of the security mechanisms in the back but I like this analogy with the skewer and it may help you a little bit with making it easier to understand at least that's my hope the distributed ledger now is basically a set of skewers a whole bunch of skewers that are all connected with one another and every skewer is like the other skewer with a very few exceptions that we'll talk about later on. So it is not a single point where the information is stored, it is a series of points where the information is stored and it's all constantly updated. There's this whole concept of keys and when I say keys I mean software keys obviously it's private keys and it's public keys. On the left the public key is a very simple key and you can access a certain amount of information which the owner of the blockchain may allow you or not allow you to to look at so when I say owner there are blockchains that are private there are blockchains for example around identity and personal data where I for one would want certain people to see a subset of the information and then others to see a different subset of the information now I can manage that with my private key I can decrypt the blockchain, I can change the chain and I can encrypt it again. So that is basically the whole concept of a public key versus a private key. Now it is immutable and to explain to you what immutability in the context of blockchain means I need to go and dive a little bit into computer science. But I try to keep it really light and it's all about hashing. So hashing is basically the translation of any kind of information in written information into a long hash now whatever coding mechanism I use whatever algorithm I use to hash information um, creates a different hash but in this case we're using the gold standard the 256 hash uh, which then creates out of a name such as Florian Krüger this 0C2A947 yada 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 now if somebody gets this cash this hash they don't necessarily know that this is Florian Kruger but if they want to see whether it's Florian Kruger they can enter Florian Kruger and they get they're gonna get exactly the same hash it's just a translation of Florian Kruger but it can't be reverse translate now the nice thing is if you have a bidding process or if you have some sort of business negotiation and you need to basically put in two bits or put in uh, two sets of information that you want to verify later on that you want to compare with one another you can enter this information and you can then go ahead and verify it later on by entering the same information on another machine creating another hash and then mapping the hashes with one another if they are identical then the information entered has been the same so there are plenty of examples which make it really easy to understand such as for example if I wanted to uh, buy a car and uh, the car salesperson says well what's your best offer and I said well I'm not going to tell you because then you're going to tell me that this is not enough so I'm going to put my very best offer down as a hash I'm going to send it to you and then you can send me your minimum price and if we can get within five percent then we can agree now I sent him the hash he sends me his hash and then we tell each other what our numbers were by actually validating the hashes of the other person with one another uh, that is a very simple example on how hashes can be valuable for you you cannot mess with it and predict the outcome you cannot uh, change a two with a one and then say this is now XYZ this is changing everything entirely and you cannot reverse calculate it um, you can play around a little bit with it if you want to with uh, with these address that I put down here under xorbin.com tools they have this 256 hash calculator and you can just yeah use it uh, in, in daily life really if you want to so the other thing is that you have special nodes as special nodes are basically mining nodes that are there to validate and to mine they are also there to find consensus between the nodes where basically a set of algorithms and a set of what-ifs make sure that the uh, consensus is reached 
and these miners use computational power and receive an economical incentive in return. Typically it is a Bitcoin and that cryptocurrency component that we're just going to talk about in a bit, which then gets um, exchanged for the mining effort. Now you have development tools as well and development tools are for example smart contracts which you can use as applications on the blockchain. What a smart contract is basically a series of what ifs on both sides and no middleman. So you have somebody that holds an asset and somebody that has money whether it's digital money or real money doesn't matter. So in order to execute on a smart contract you have a string of what ifs and if these what ifs are met then both goods get exchanged immediately uh, and at the same time. So that is a smart contract. You can define the what ifs. As a buyer and as a seller you can agree on what the what ifs are and what the prerequisites for the execution of the smart contract are which makes it really really easy to use and really nice and user friendly. Uh, it also sits at the heart of private proprietary chains where you want certain blockchains not to see the light of day, not to be accessible to everybody. For example, if it's around uh, you know, private sensitive data, uh, think medical records for example, uh, which, are, which have to be somewhere secure. And then there is this whole story around application and use cases. So the blockchain itself, even if it's a private one, per se doesn't hold any intrinsic value. But if you have a very good use case, you can design the smart contract and the interactions between the various players on that blockchain in a way that it represents an, a basic application, which then means it starts to make sense and it starts to create value. So use cases could be, for example, the taking out of the middle office in the settlement, the reduction of the time in the claims processing, the improvement of the automation in trade finance, the execution of international payments, you know, remittances, instantaneous remittances without 10 or 20% in, in commissions that would need to be paid. And of course, it, it allows a better AML KYC compliance so anti-money laundering, I should probably explain it, and know your customer compliance, um, which is significant. Now, cryptocurrencies, just to round it off, um, because we've said in the very beginning the blockchain is not the Bitcoin, but still there are cryptocurrencies. So what are these cryptocurrencies? I'll give you an example. Now, if I send you an email from you, from me to you, and I put in that email, this email is one flow coin. I have just created my own digital currency. If you are silly enough to accept it, well then good for me and now I can ask for something in return. So it can be a good or it can be something else. Now that would be a digital currency example. If I now hash it then it becomes kind of a cryptocurrency because it is immutable, it's secure, it's something unique and it's not really changeable. The whole idea of immutable. I can then send it to distributed ledgers and keep it timestamped and unique as well as uh, proof of its provenance. Now if I do this, I have the whole concept of distributed ledgers with a cryptocurrency on a digital currency, which then is basically a cryptocurrency on a blockchain and it is basically something like Bitcoin. Um, you ask why it's different and how it actually works, well let me, s let me explain to you in I try to explain it in very simple terms. Since it is an alternative for digital currency which is decentralized using only digital control mechanisms, it needs computational power to be created. The way how this is done is it is done through rewards after solving riddles. And the riddles are mathematical problems, mathematical challenges that take the computer a certain amount of time and increasingly so because the riddles are getting more and more complex. So at the very beginning of the blockchain of, of Bitcoin, excuse me, the very beginning of Bitcoin there was an almost infinite um, amount 
of potential riddles that could be solved in, in, in a very easy and simple fashion and needed little computational power, which meant that we had a huge supply of Bitcoin and we had very little demand because nobody knew what to do with it. Now, over time, this has changed. The, the Bitcoin components have been generated time and time again, and the riddles have become more and more difficult. Therefore, finding a new bit Bitcoin is very difficult. That means that the supply has been reduced. Now, at the same time, the demand has increased because of the reduced supply and the general understanding that there is a certain correlation between computational power and solving riddles and value creation. Now, this is real anarchy in the financial sector. Um, examples for the various cryptocurrencies that are out there, and there are currently at least 40, 45 uh, that are noteworthy, and then there's an infinite amount of others that are probably just have just been created, like I gave you my example around the flow coin. Now, we have the Bitcoin, who's now, uh, which is now predominantly residing in China. We have the Ether, we have the Dash, we have Mastercoins, we have Monero, which is in the darknet. We have something that's also used for settling, which is Ripple. And we have Titcoin, and you have, I have no idea where this name comes from, but you can probably guess. The main companies behind the technologies, the main companies behind the disruptive ideas currently as we see them are um, development platforms such as Ethereum, are open source collaboration platforms such as Hyperledger, our wallets which are also Hyperledger members like blockchain, uh, financial systems and service providers such as Coinbase, Ripple, as I said, with real-time settlement, Dash, which is a cryptocurrency service. We have a consortium or various consortiums for research and standardization, which then are also Hyperledger members. And we have other applications, such as, for example, for provenance, provenance for diamonds in this case, Everledger. And then we have Fintricity, which does agile use case business approach, meaning we basically try and put some sense into this whole story of blockchain and cryptocurrencies and what have you. The future, in our opinion, is very exciting. Or to use a Trumpism bigly, the future is self-driving cars. The future is programmable money. The future means that you can give permission to any money. You can put money in specific wallets. You can buy energy only from a specific rooftop because now the energy gets hashed. You can verify whether the various devices that are floating around your house are actually entitled to communicate with your home automation system, for example. You can think industrial automation because things can be automated very easily since they are secure and safe. You can also think personal data. So degrees, your age, all that information, the background information, the little envelope that you hold dearly and have probably in a safe somewhere can now sit on a blockchain. And since it's a distributed ledger, the risk is quite marginal. And the whole question who you are, this whole big push to get one global identity for everybody, this will and has to sit on the blockchain. Now, this is exciting. In terms of timings, this stuff is going to happen. This stuff is going to happen soon. And when I say this stuff, then let's split it apart. There is the blockchain and there is the currency component. So blockchain will be a key component for most of the digital companies, if not all of them, within the next one to two years. And over time, people will adopt this whole notion of cryptocurrencies, of digital currencies, and use these more and more because it is understood the correlation between supply and demand. That is a little bit of an information around blockchain. I try to keep it deliberately light, and I hope you got something out of it. So if you have any questions, please mail me at florian.kruger at fintricity.com. So that is F-L-O-R-I-A-N dot K-R-U-E-G-E-R at fintricity.com. Or Skype me on FBJK2000. That's Foxtrot Bravo Juliet Kilo 2000. Anytime, day and night, I'm there to answer your questions. So thank you very much for your attention, everybody, and have a wonderful day.